Oh, hello there, Chuck. <laughs> I didn't see you there. How are you? Hmm? Good. Just uh, editing the episode. What's up? <laughs> What's up? Oh, you commoner and your common talk. I guess I'm what you would say, <laughs> doing not much. <laughs> what is this? Chuck. Chuck, it's me, your pal Brady. I'm practicing patronizing, so I'm working on being more condescending to people. <laughs> oh, Ooh. do you have any idea my man can get some crumpets around here? <laughs> uh, wh- why are you doing this? You know, for our Patreon, we've been asking people to patronize our page, and I didn't want to ask them to do something I wasn't willing to do it myself, so I figured I'd get some practice. In. Oh, God. Brady, no, that's, huh? that's what? not what it means. Oh, no? Listen. Listeners can go to our Patreon page, pick the level you want to contribute. Each level has special rewards. Okay. Like exclusive life after minisodes. Or not safe for work bloopers? Uh, Or like a monthly collection of deconstruction memes. And even personal consultations or meet up with your favorite host, Chuck and Brady? Yeah. Brady. Patreon.com slash the life (laughs) after. I guess even you could find it. (laughs) Hey everyone, it's your co-host Chuck Parson. Quick trigger warning, we will be talking about hell and quoting some scripture in this episode. As always, we only do this to the end of helping us dismantle the systems of belief that we believe are traumatizing us and holding us back. But, in case you aren't in a good place for it, we just wanted to warn you. So Brady and I recently interviewed actress and founder of the post-faith organization Dare to Doubt, Alice Gretchen. Now, that's not the interview you're about to hear. It's definitely coming out soon. The reason I bring it up is because in that interview, we got into something I think is pretty poignant to the episode you are about to hear. Alice talked with us about how the Bible actually helped her with her deconstruction. Now, that might sound super contradictory, but hear me out because I'd never thought of it in those terms, and I think she's onto something. For those of us that know the Bible very, very well, I think there's a certain amount of comfort that comes from the fact that it's so absurd and incongruent. When we were professing Christians, of course, most of us were super in denial about how nonsensical the Bible actually is. But now, having deconstructed, we don't have a dog in the fight anymore. And without that emotional investment, we can look at it more objectively. And this is where it might start to work for us instead of against us. Now, I know a lot of our listeners are way too triggered by the Bible to go back to reading it. Don't worry, I'm not asking you to. And some of you are still struggling with your indoctrination so much that reading the Bible just feels like regression. But I want to look at the Bible from the perspective of Judo. I'll explain what I mean. I spent 18 years of my life studying martial arts. Judo, as a subgenre of jiu-jitsu, is particularly interesting because it's about taking the momentum of someone who's attacking you and using it to make them do what you want to do. So if someone is pushing their weight into you from in front of you, it's about finding a way to use that energy to throw them behind you, since that's the way they're already pushing. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about confronting death. And for a lot of us, there is an inseparable connection between death and hell, or the fear of hell. Especially for those of us who are immersed in Christian thought from our earliest memories, hell felt like a reality, a place that exists in the present where people who don't believe are sent after judgment. I remember looking at the ground as a kid, wondering how there could be people and fire underneath, how far down it was. When I learned about the earth's molten mantle layer, I assumed that had something to do with hell. There just seems to be a part of our brain that will always think it's real and always be afraid that if we don't play our cards right, we'll end up going there. First of all, I just don't base my life on anything that isn't observable, and hell isn't observable. But what has maybe been more helpful for me has been taking the time to understand what the Bible actually says about hell, because, well, honestly, it's not that much, and it's a lot more confusing than the way it was presented to most of us in church. Now, obviously, there isn't time for a comprehensive treatise, but I want to share a couple of points that really helped me deal with this fear. But I actually want to start by talking about what the Bible doesn't say about hell. The first thing I always like to point out is the Gospel of John never mentions hell. Not a single time. It mentions condemnation, but it never says what kind, or for how long, or where, or what it looks like. It basically just says that you're already condemned if you don't believe in Jesus. Condemned to what? We don't know. Worth noting, This is used in the verses immediately following what is easily the most popular verse in the Bible in America, John 3.16. So that might not sound that important, but you have to put it in context. If John the Evangelist wrote this book, which is incredibly debatable like all biblical authorship, he would have written it with an audience in mind. His gospel is distinct from the other three, containing almost entirely different stories and emphases. Don't you think if John was telling the Jesus story, and he believed the concept of eternal conscious torment was the consequence of not following Jesus, he would include that in his lengthy account of the gospel? 
If the New Testament won't be canonized for several hundred years, and it's a full millennium before the invention of the print press, John's gospel would have been the only exposure to the gospel that some people had access to. That was literally the point of writing it. If it was meant to be a comprehensive account of everything John thought was important to know about Jesus, don't you think he would have included hell? The second thing I like to point out, often the confounded phase, is that the Old Testament has essentially no reference to an afterlife at all. There are one or two verses where it might, sort of. The word that's translated hell in more dated translations like the KJV is Sheol, which actually means the grave or the pit, basically referring to people being buried after they die or decaying back into the earth. Passages like, let my soul die with the Philistines and judges, or as for the dead, they are conscious of nothing at all. Ecclesiastes 9 suggests that the Old Testament holds an annihilationist view of death, meaning that we just cease to exist when we die, not unlike modern nihilism. In fact, most scholars agree the idea of hell as we understand it today doesn't appear in the Jewish tradition until the Maccabean period between the Old and New Testament. Shortly after the Protestant Old Testament ends, Jerusalem was seized by several foreign entities, ultimately resulting in years and years of persecution for Jews. So scholars think the Judeo-Christian idea of hell was the result of heavily persecuted Jews of the time, trying to make sense of how God could be good and love them while their day-to-day lives were so bad. In other words, God must have had a way of punishing these terrible people that they weren't seeing because they were definitely winning in spite of the ongoing devotion of the population to God. Our more committed listeners may recall our interview with Andrew Josko in episode 5 of this season where we discuss how the Judeo-Christian concept of hell may actually be a trauma response to years and years of oppression. On top of that, these ideals seem to correspond with the rise of Platonian ideals, the proposition that the soul is separate from the body and that the physical realm is inferior to the spiritual realm, which sounds way more like the teachings of Jesus than the teachings of the Old Testament, and even more like Paul, who was criticized for Hellenizing the gospel. I mean, seriously, the ideological differences between the Old and New Testament are so stark and the influence of the culture at large on the New Testament is so profound, and they just never talked about this stuff in Sunday school, right? Did they even mention how the rise of Alexander the Great spread Hellenistic ideas throughout the Jewish world, causing several schisms and inflating the proposition of an afterlife? No, they did not, but it definitely happened. You particularly see this in the first schism between Paul's followers and Peter's followers. Paul runs with the body-soul duality, while Peter sticks with the more traditional Jewish view. But that's like, a whole other thing for another day. So in several rabbinic texts, in the give or take 400 years between the Old and New Testament, we begin to see Gehenna, a physical place outside Jerusalem, used to describe a place of conscious torment in the afterlife. And Jesus, having read those texts, seems to just jump on board with using that language. This is the word Jesus uses the most to refer to hell in the Gospels. So on this issue, Jesus is actually taking a side in one of the biggest disputes between two Jewish sects the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that is, whether or not there is a resurrection in an afterlife. Frankly, it was a trendy debate to have, which to me somewhat discredits Jesus' authority on the issue. It's not like he was introducing it to the world. He picked a side in an argument that they had already started. These types of debates come and go. In America in 2004, gay marriage was a huge debate point in politics, but healthcare wasn't. Now it's the opposite. To me, and not just on this issue, it seems more like Jesus was chiming in on the trending hot takes than he was imparting game-changing divine wisdom. So in my mind, we have this issue of why all of a sudden God was super concerned with what happens after we die, as if for a few thousand years it was pretty clearly all about these esoteric rituals and moral teachings, which, if they weren't properly followed, would result in Israel or Judah being overthrown and God's people being punished that way, to something like, never mind these earthly kingdoms, pay your taxes to your oppressor, and concern yourself with what happens after you die. It just seems really weird, right? One of my favorite books on the topic is Rob Bell's Love Wins. This highly controversial book in the evangelical world is a case for what's known as the doctrine of ultimate reconciliation, which is a specific form of universalism. You may remember John Piper's famous tweet, Farewell, Rob Bell, upon the book's release, implying that the book was a departure from orthodoxy. Honestly, the book is a little wishy-washy from an academic perspective. There are much better intellectual cases out there for the doctrine, but it's a solid introduction if you aren't familiar with it. Now, since the Bible is a decidedly incongruent document, the debate over this topic and what Bell claims in the book will continue ad infinitum among believers. But my favorite part is the first chapter. In the first chapter, Bell goes through all these scenarios and verses that raise questions about the nature of hell and salvation, questions that church leaders hate 
Like, what if someone never hears the gospel? What if you, quote, pray the prayer, but don't mean it? Or change your mind? Or what is the age of accountability, and why doesn't the Bible address it? And then these more nuanced questions about soteriology that the gospels raise. I'll paraphrase a few, like, why was the man executed alongside Jesus granted paradise just by asking to be remembered? Or why was Zacchaeus, quote, visited by salvation for returning his money to the poor? Nicodemus is told to be born again with no explanation of what that means, although it was a phrase that was used at the time for Gentiles who converted to Judaism. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, if you forgive others, God will forgive you, but if you don't, he won't. So, do you just need to forgive others? And if you accept Christ on John 3.16 terms, but don't forgive others, do you go to heaven or do you go to hell? Mark chapter 2 says that the paralyzed man's sins were forgiven because his friends had the faith to lower him through a roof. He doesn't say or do anything as far as we know. So what's my point here? My point is that biblical soteriology or the study of salvation is super convoluted and confusing. And I just tend to think that if hell was real and understanding those texts was so important, it would look more like an instruction manual than a convoluted narrative. It would have to be easy for people to understand, even if they don't devote their lives to studying it. I know that we all grew up with the John 3.16 approach and the pray the prayer rhetoric and the very simple idea that if you don't quote, accept Jesus, you go to hell. But you have to understand that these are very, very boxy oversimplifications of the issue that fits post-enlightenment Western thinking way better than it fits the Hebrew culture Jesus emerged from. At the time, in Jewish thought, the question was way more important than the answer. And frankly, as modern Westerners, it's really, really hard for us to wrap our minds around that. But it's right in front of us in the text. Jesus usually responds to questions with other questions. And out of all the questions Jesus has asked in the Gospels, he only directly answers two. So at best, the text is unclear on what happens when we die. And it's unclear on what we have to do to be saved. And frankly, it's unclear on purpose. So I think it's safe for all of us to abandon this idea that we're going to hell for X, Y, Z, because the Bible itself doesn't really tell us one way or the other. This leads to my last point. The evangelical concept of hell and judgment is probably the issue that modern Western Christianity has done the best job protecting through a process of erasing large portions of the Bible. In other words, to believe that the Bible decidedly teaches eternal conscious torment, you have to ignore a number of key texts. I'll give you some examples. Uh, As all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, 1 Corinthians. Uh, for no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, Lamentations 3. Or, we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially those who believe. Or, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things, whether things on earth, or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Colossians 1. So, all of those verses sound like God is saving everyone and everything in heaven and on earth, right? As a matter of fact, some advocates argue that there are more key verses that suggest some form of ultimate reconciliation over eternal conscious torment. Again, that's just a lot to ignore. And this is not a new debate either. Throughout Christian history, since the beginning, there has always been a threat of theologians who believed in an alternative to eternal conscious torment. Even Augustine, the father of modern theology, stated, quote, There are many in our day who, though not denying the Holy Scriptures, do not believe in endless torments. Anyway, look. My point is obviously not to sit here and convince you that the Bible teaches one form of eternity over another or that it teaches one form of salvation over another. Those kinds of debates are so painfully boring to me at this point. My point is that the Bible doesn't actually know what it teaches. And maybe moreover, the people who taught us about hell from the pulpit or from Sunday school most likely had no idea what they were talking about. They never considered any of these factors in the debate because their teachers never considered them either. And even if they did, they didn't want to be labeled as a heretic by talking about it. Because fundamentalism, and evangelicalism in particular, are too scared to ask the questions that are right in front of them in the text, and they're culturally forbidden to do so. Imagine you were at a restaurant, and you were flipping through the menu, and you noticed that the lobster tail was listed three times. One description said it was grilled cold water lobster tail, lightly seasoned with Cajun spices, sea salt, and butter. 
One said it was boiled lobster tail with ketchup, mustard, onion, lettuce, tomato, and American cheese. And one said it was three-day-old room-temperature lobster tail served with cold hot dog water and whatever stuck to the McDonald's wrappers in the dishwasher's back seat. You wouldn't think to yourself, this restaurant is normal. These descriptions, although distinct, are basically the same, and I think I will order the lobster tail without asking any questions, and also encourage my friends to do so as well. But this is basically what we do with the doctrine of hell. The Christian concept of hell has the credibility of an urban legend. The story varies significantly by region and changes over time. The sources are untraceable and the evidence is unobservable. There's just no need to be afraid of something when the people who claim to have seen it or have exclusive knowledge of it can't agree on the nature of it. It's probably just not real. And that's the takeaway. Hell isn't real. And we aren't going there when we die. Even if we don't believe anymore, Even if we, quote, turned our backs on God, or even if we're actively fighting against the teachings of the Bible and the church. So just trust your own reason and critical thinking on this one. And each time that fear starts to bubble up in your gut, tell it to go to hell. Honestly, you have more tangible things to worry about. That's all I've got for today. After this break, our interview with Dave Warnock. Let me unpack that for you a little bit. Welcome to the Life After This is Brady Harden. And I am Chuck Parson. Today, uh, we're going to be talking about death. <laughs> Way to go. Man, I love it when we alley oop. Yeah, that yeah, we're, right, we're right on that. He shoots, he, sh- he scores. He shoots, was, he scores. That was great. Um, you know, we talked about it a little bit in season one, right? Um, let's rehash. Uh, yeah. Episode two, I believe it was. Two or three, yeah. One, of the, one of the first ones. Is with Zach, yes. Mm-hmm. And so he talked about how he was evangelical his whole life, and then he came down and he almost died and came really face-to-face with his mortality and how facing that without having the faith that you grew up with your whole life you kind of have to rearrange your brain and how you deal with grief sure. and um, create new ways to deal with shit. Right. Yeah. Uh, healthier ways. <laughs> ways that don't involve like uh, magical thinking, ma- make believe coping but, mechanisms. Okay. I'm going to push back on that a little bit because I think there are times where that magical thinking can benefit somebody, but it's not harming, but you're right. It's not built on reality. So it's like, if you're making an, you know, an exception of how you make decisions, if you use magical thinking in every area of your life that way, you're going to fall into a lot of weird ditches. Right. Right. But it, and then it's weird just to kind of like, no, I have critical thinking skills, but then on this one thing, just because it gives me hope, <laughs> then you make that one exception to have magical thinking. For sure. Hmm. I get what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we are here today with uh, our guest Dave Warnock. Uh, Dave was. We're, we're gonna. We'll just jump right in with a little spoiler. Spoiler alert. Dave uh, was a few months ago diagnosed with ALS, uh, otherwise known as Lou Gehrig's disease. Or how long ago was that? Um, that was what. Dave? February 26th, so March, April, May, June, July, yeah. about five months, a yeah. little over five mm. months ago. Mm. Right. Um, and it, along with that diagnosis came the uh, the reality that uh, Dave only has two to five years to live, depending on how the disease progresses. And um, that's, that is where we find Dave uh, today. So how's it going today, Dave? It's good. Good. I mean, you know, I'm alive. I'm alive. So it's you're, a good day. you're alive, man. You're doing it. So you, uh, it's all about perspective. Yeah, it, apparently, because uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'd be doing as well as you as you're doing, but you know, I guess you don't know until you get there. Um, that's really true. You know, people people are telling me over and over again how um, I don't know how you're doing this. You're inspiring. Mm. Blah blah blah. And you know, I definitely have my bad days. But I think we just do what we do when we get there, and we don't right. know how we're going to do with something until we're there. And, mm. then, and then you just have to say, okay, now what do I do? And I think more people then realize 
would do as well as I am. You know, if you just if you're a person who deals with reality as it is and not as you want it to be, hmm. then uh, and and as a secular person now, that's kind of how I've been living for the last seven years. So I don't live with with wishful thinking like you did as a Christian. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you just accept it, and I think more people uh, would do better than they think they would. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that. So Dave, you were a a pastor uh, for many many years, right? And you're a practicing evangelical for a long time. Yes, uh, I was saved to use that term and mm-hmm. baptized in the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues okay. at the right ripe age of 18 back in 1973. Okay. Oh, damn. So in, in in the height of the Jesus movement. Ah, uh, the mm, Jesus I got, movement. Yeah, I was a Jesus <laughs> I was a street preacher, coffee house ministry, the oh, whole thing. Right. Damn, boy. And, and, and back then, we thought Jesus was coming back next week. Yeah, so shit. it's all about urgency, you know, got to get out, got to save the lost, we got to sure. do this thing, we got, we got the work of the kingdom to do, and, um, you know, Jesus didn't come back like next week. He didn't come back <laughs> next year. He didn't come back at all because he's not fucking real. <laughs> right. well, I mean, we've been on this uh, slippery slope of 2,000 years of just... Yeah, I exactly. think that, do you remember the show at Arrested Development? They had this ongoing joke yeah. where when a character was waiting for their dad... Uh, but then he was like waiting to go on a fishing trip, right? And so he's like sitting with his tackle box, and his dad never shows up. That was never us for two thousand years. Two thousand years. Still waiting on the edge of our seats. It's going to happen any day now. Paul, as long I mean, as Paul thought, alive. Was, Paul thought it was going to happen in his lifetime. Well, Jesus even said that. Didn't he? As, yeah, yeah. As, yeah. As long some as of some you of will you not. Were, yeah, yeah. Perish until, it. <laughs> buddy. That that's not nice. Not pass away. That was the. Re- so that we was, twist. Sorry. Yeah. We've, we've twisted that away. Jesus said himself, this generation will not pass until you see the Son of Man come in his glory. Right. Mm. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. let's let's figure out what that means. Let's let's parse that out and make make it a reason I think that was, for why. I think that was the riskiest. Sorry. Sorry, I interrupted yeah. you. Uh, I think that's, that's the riskiest shot Jesus took. I think he was he was really like, you know, like well, if if everything he really else he said as, was like, as oh, they say. Sorry. I mean, if he was a real dude, if he was a real dude that really did what he, what they said he did, and said what he, what the gospel said he, I, I think he may have thought that was the thing. I mean, there were prophets popping up every other week right, in that right. day and age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very. He true. was just another one. That and the other thing about Christianity is if you do criticize like uh, that verse and then say, well, you know, he was saying he's coming back, then other Christians are like, well, no, no, that's not what he was saying. There, there isn't any, you know. And so it's like every, it's like whack a mole. You have to get like one theory down and then just prove it in another. And then there's always like all this tension between like nobody, yeah, gets, nobody, it's, it's, no doctor. You got to make same. excuses for what he said. You got to mm-hmm. make excuses for it. Explain it away. And my God, it's so, it's it's exhausting to try to. Uh, explain that shit you know it's, right. just, it's exhausting and i'm so glad not to do it anymore but what did your <laughs> life look like when you were doing that like uh what did describe pastor dave to me well i lived um i was a pastor a lot of those years a lot of those years and a lot of the years i was just a lay minister and, and had my own businesses and stuff so it was a checkered career to be to be sure but um I was always involved in in leadership, to use that phrase that they love to use. Mm-hmm. So from the time from the time I was uh, uh, saved, at the age of eighteen, I was very involved with all kinds of of ministry, uh, from small groups to pastoring to um, coffee house ministry to uh, worship leading to youth leading, all the shit. But when you when you come across passages like that that can't be taken at face value because they don't make sense. Then you develop a whole theological – I mean, volumes of books have been written about that one verse. What did Jesus mean when he said, this generation will not pass away until I, until I return? Well, they're talking about when the fig tree blooms, and that's when, the, the, when Israel becomes a nation, which is 1948. So a generation <laughs> is 40 years. And, I mean, you can write yeah, a yep. fucking library. Trying yeah, to yeah. Red yeah. yarn going shit. all Just around the room. John Hagee. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> In what language? Yeah, right. 
So it's and and you just you just you go you twist it, yourself into a pretzel hmm. trying to explain all that shit, you know? That and freeze. and so it's so relieving to be free from having to explain that stuff. And even with my current situation and the way that life works, um, I don't have to try to figure out where God is in this because God's mm. not in it. And so it's just life. It's just life happening. Wow. And it makes it makes it so much simpler. Because we, we always rushed around to think, where is God in this? Where is God in this? Uh, what, right. what, yeah. what, what, what that fucking question was, what is God trying to teach you? And, you know, what is God saying? What is God saying? What is God saying? Well, he's not yeah. saying anything. Yeah. You know? Yeah, That's yeah, the reality. yeah. It's yeah, yeah. And if he was, he's responsible for communicating that, right? You know, like <laughs> yes. because the point of communication is you 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 encode a message and then somebody else decodes it. But whenever it's like with God, we're responsible for both fucking sides of that. Yeah, yeah and yeah, yeah. that yeah. responsibility, even if he was real, that's just it's a one way conversation, and that's mm. that's really that's really what after thirty something years as an evangelical Christian. Back in uh, seven, eight years ago, when I was going through the process of deconversion, that was one of the things that became crystal clear to me. This has been a one-sided conversation for all these years, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 the way that I, the way that I, that it came to me was, God is not there, and He's never been there, and He's never been saying anything, and He's never been doing anything, and I've been doing all this on my own, and I'm worn out, mm, and that yeah. was. Yep. That was the realization that I was that that it wasn't real and that's when I let go of it. I just said, "Okay, this stuff's not real. I thought it was. I gave everything I had to it." Yeah. Um and and I couldn't have given any more than I did. I gave the best years of my life. I gave hmm. I mean, I was all in, guys. I lived it, I breathed yeah. it, I studied the word, I preached it, I taught it to my kids. I mean, if someone says to me, you never really were a Christian, Jesus. then I will say to them, <sighs> then nobody can be because nobody tried it harder than I did. Right. Sure. Absolutely. Well, yeah. God, I there hate that go. gaslighting bullshit. Yeah. What do they call that? The know. true Scotsman fallacy or something? That idea of like, um, <laughs> yeah. oh, well, then you weren't a true Scotsman. Then, you know, it's just, fuck that shit. You know, there really is like, I like the way that you said that because it's it just sounds like you like you grinded for 30 years, like you were just hard on the grinder and just like working, just working so hard. And then you were like, fuck it, I'm not doing this anymore. It's not getting me anywhere. And there really is like a, like a really powerful sense of relief when you finally just decide like, I'm not doing this anymore. The world, the world makes so much more sense if you look at it from that standpoint that there's mm. no God anywhere doing anything for anyone. And the world just happens, and life just happens, and there's good shit that happens, and there's bad shit that happens. And when we look at it like that, that we're just humans doing our best to make it work, and there's no God doing anything, it just makes more sense. For sure. Um, You know, I've I've been thinking about this recently. So, like, we go from a worldview that has, like, order and meaning and reason— and we and we are like constantly racking our brains to apply order and reason and meaning to everything because we believe that there's this God that's orchestrating everything to his will and everything is supposed to make sense or it will one day, you know, when we're dead yeah, and we're yeah. watching our, <laughs> the, the, the movie. movie. <laughs> yeah, when we're watching the fucking movie and we're like, oh, wow, if, you know... If my, you know, if my son hadn't accrued that brain injury that disabled him for the rest of his life, this terrible thing would have, you know what I mean? And it's all that bullshit, but it's like the reality is chaos, right? Mm. And and that's one of the hardest transitions from from Christianity to to not believing anything or believing something else is that you have to accept the chaos and there's like mm. it's a mixed bag right there's good and bad that comes with that so how how was that transition for you and what what is that what does chaos mean to you versus the order well chaos does not frighten me at all um what what i what an epiphany i had a few years back i cuz i deconverted and then I, I was married at the time and my wife remained a believer and does to this day and my my family is all christians most of them and um, so I was very much alone in this journey. And um, after a few years of trying to stay in a marriage where there was huge disconnect in worldviews oh, yeah. and ideology, I let that go. And so about three years ago, I completely rebooted my life. 
I left the marriage and I and I really began to ask myself the question, what do I want the balance of my life to look like? And mind you, I'm doing this in my 60s now, okay? So it's not like I've got a lot of life left even before the ALS diagnosis. But still, I'm thinking, I want to make the best use of whatever time I have. Hmm. And the the epiphany that I had was simple. It was that that life is nothing more than a collection of moments. Like you were just saying, there's no big grand plan. There's no scheme where it all fits together. There's no order. It's just chaos. It's random. It's unpredictable. And it's oh so brief. And and what we have to do is focus on the moments that we have. And mm. and they're not related to one another. You know, a moment stands alone. Mm. It doesn't have to be tied to some series of moments. And there's such beauty and simplicity in that because we can live every day as though it's a brand new day because it is. And we can live every day as though it might be our last because it might. So it makes everything so much simpler in terms of how you view life and, and your daily living. Mm. Yeah, I, t- I 100% agree with you. It just puts, I mean, like, just in in terms of, like, good and bad things that happen, like, a lot of, I think a lot of people find comfort, a lot of Christians and a lot of religious people find comfort in the idea that, oh, well, this is planned by God, and they, and they have comfort in that. But to me, it's like, what kind of fucked up God plans this, you know? It's like, what are you, like... That nothing about that is comforting if, to me. It's actually if he's kind of terrifying. This, he's doing a, yeah, if he's planning this, he's doing a really bad job. I mean, let's just be real. It's honestly more. It, I mean, especially the further I distance myself from Christianity, it is so much easier for me to accept things, knowing that nothing decided or didn't decide that it would happen. You know what I mean? Mm, it's just right, right, right. The right. universe yeah, is function. It's cause it, and effect. It, it, it just happens, and and like I was talking to my daughter-in-law a couple of years ago, and she, her and my son kind of let go of all of it too a couple of years ago, but oh, wow. she just said to me this simple statement. She came to the realization that life pretty much works as though there were no God, mm. and yeah. and yeah. that's that's just a simple way to look at it because it really does. It's really true. I identify as secular as atheist. And so people do the whole like, well, how do you know there's not a God, you know? And with me, I got fooled. Like I was gullible. Let's be honest. Like that yeah. word, it's a word yeah. for a reason. Right. And mm-hmm. so I look back and I realize, okay, I was kind of fucking gullible. I fell for a lot of stupid shit. And, um, my job now as a human being as an adult is to learn from my mistakes and to modify my behavior and figure out new ways to do that and so i realized that each one of my faith journeys because i i was really evangelical then i became a calvinist which felt like a whole deconstruction of people lost their shit and then leaving the faith completely each one of those kind of taught me how people respond to those things Right, You know, mm-hmm. and I've started to see this is kind of a similar thing. And so I, I started to realize I, my repeating mistake was that when people came to me with really unbelievable conclusions, I would accept them. Mm-hmm. So what I learned was, how about I not be responsible for anything that can't show its work? Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's a Missouri exactly. thing. Exactly. You know, yeah. and and if that it, makes me a materialistic, you know, atheist who you know is an evidence obsessed, whatever. But for me, it's 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 goddamn survival, right? Like it's a survival well, it makes instinct. Sense. I mean, when someone says to you, "How do you know there's no God?" I don't have to. I don't have to answer that. And I don't have to know there's no God. You, you're hmm. the one that's making the claim there's a God. You don't have to burn so, the proof. The, the, evi- the, the burden of proof's on you. Mm-hmm. And and all I'm saying is, I see no evidence to to show that there is one. So I'm going to go with the evidence. I'm going to go with what I can see, mm-hmm. feel, touch, and know. And if, if, and, and I've like, I've, I've heard it said before, if you can show me, and I, I've said this to Christians, yeah. if you can give me some solid evidence that there's, that the Christian God of the Bible is real, then I'll accept that. Mm-hmm. That said, I still won't worship him because he's a, he's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> the, God right. Bible, the God of the Bible's a dick. Let's right. just, I mean, he is. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, so I, yeah. I wouldn't worship him if I did see that he was real. I'd say, okay, he's real, but I don't. I want nothing to do with him. So, uh, le- I, I, I don't want to get too too sad, but I want to. I kind of want to paint the picture, right, of the of the the place you are in life, right? So, can you talk to us a little bit about ALS and what it entails? 
um, and, and, and why it's terminal? Well, it's terminal because there's no cure for it. There's no medicine for it. It's a motor neuron disease, and it, uh, what happens for reasons unknown, it randomly attacks people. Um, there's a f- small percentage of it that's hereditary, like 5%, mm. but mm. for most of it, it's, it's just random as fuck. Mm. And it just, it's, a, it's a disease that you're, essentially your, mu- your nerves quit communicating with your muscles. Mm-hmm. And your muscles quit working, mm-hmm. and it, it 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 attacks different parts of the body. For me, right now, it's mostly my hands and my arms, and I'm losing strength in those. So mm-hmm. little things like using my hands to open packages, to twist a bottle cap this this is a challenge. Mm-hmm. There's there's little things that are becoming more problematic. So gradually, I will lose the ability to use my hands and arms, mm. and and. And then it can go to my mouth. It can go to my legs. Eventually, it goes to my diaphragm, which mm. then causes my lung, my lungs Shit. to quit functioning, and, mm. and, and then that's, that's when I die. So it's a very ugly disease. I've yeah. met other other ALS people, and they're in wheelchairs. They can't talk. They can't walk. They can't handle things. It's it's a hideous disease that uh, doesn't end well. Mm. And so <clears throat> that's my. Um, that's my foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, and, you know, unless there's some cure that they find uh, in the near future, and there's some stuff they're working on, but it's a long way off. Yeah. Um, and, and it just, it progresses slowly in some, and for me right now, it's slow. Um, some it attacks more rigorously, and they, they have a shorter life. Some live a lot longer than the average. So it's very, very unpredictable. So I I feel like a lot of Christians would hear you describe that and they would say, dude, how can you not come back to God after that? You know what I mean? Like, what if like you're confronted, you're confronted with death, you are, you need a miracle to live, right? And, uh, and the idea of an afterlife sounds like a second chance. It sounds like an out. It sounds like something to look forward to, to make this process easier. But you know, you've lived both lives, believing in a benevolent God and then not believing in a benevolent God. Uh, do you feel like like going back to your old beliefs would benefit you in any way? Or do you, are you just... You you can't believe what you can't believe. You can't right. choose yes. what to believe. Right. Sure. I mean, I tell people, uh, can you just decide to believe in Santa Claus again? You can't. So yeah. I can't make myself believe in something I no longer believe in. It's just not... Uh, and I've told my daughters this, you know, that, that I, you, you might as well ask me to grow a hand out of my forehead. It's just, sure. as, I, yeah. I could just as easily do that. I can't yeah. manufacture that. Sure. So it's either, it's either there or it's not. And for me, it's just not. And the idea of an eternity. Now, first of all, I want to speak to that because uh-huh. the idea of, the idea of eternity, let's just be real. That's that's some fucked up shit. Yeah, it sounds. <laughs> I mean, awful. E- eternity in heaven. What? I'm tired, mm, man. I'm already tired. Years of, I know uh, eternity in uh, the idea of eternity. I think it's some religious person's idealistic thinking way back when. Mm-hmm. So, no, I don't. I'm not afraid of this life being all there is. I happen to believe. This life is so amazing and so beautiful, and we're lucky to even get to do it. And there's so much beauty and wonder and beautiful moments that I don't I don't know why that's not enough for people. I really don't. Well, hey, Dave, we need to go um, to break. Uh, we'll okay, go to I got to pee, so let's do oh, that. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> when we get back, I want to ask you about about carpe carpeing the fucking diem. So uh, that's when my we get favorite. Back. Right. I thought you might say that. <laughs> I'll be right back. All right. All right we'll bye. be right back right after this because Dave has to pee. <laughs> okay, Chuck, are you ready? Have we only have one shot? We got to make this work. Uh, wait, you didn't give just just me just read an, your lines. I'll oh, give you the paper. Oh, okay. okay. Are you guys ready? Are you ready? Oh, All right. Uh, oh, uh, um. 
Are you ready to deconstruct with friends? What the, what the hell? Where did, where did all this come from? <laughs> Deconstructing your faith used you, to be lonely you got a van? and boring wait, as hell. Wait, 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 wait. But no one must wait. deconstruct their faith alone ever again when you oh. deconstruct with friends. Chuck, tell them what we mean. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Go. That's, that's right, Brady. Yeah. Uh, the life after has a... Uh, uh, what the hell, Brady? Uh, I went full on Jumanji on this one. You keep going. He's a rental <clears throat> by the hour. The, the Life After Podcast has a secret Facebook community and Slack yeah. channel for people deconstructing the, the uh, Christian fundamentalism and other oppressive religions. Uh, meet new people and, and, uh, and deconstruct with, with friends. friends. <laughs> nice job, Chuck. You even got the echo. Uh, thanks. Uh, that was kind of cool, I guess. Oh, God. He's touching me with his trunk. Uh, you can apply for the secret group it's on, our fa- Ooh, on our Facebook by answering three entrance questions. Your membership is hidden, and the admins keep the room constructive and helpful. Uh, now, can we get this elephant out of here? Nope. Probably not. But we can. Deconstruct with friends. And we're back with our guest, Dave Warnock. So, uh, Dave, you have uh, a catchphrase that you like to use a lot. Tell us about it. It's carpe the fucking diem. Um, Love it. That is actually something I had uh, a little throw pillow with that etched on it. And I I had that. Someone gave gave me that a few years ago after my divorce when I rebooted my life. Hmm. And that began to be kind of the way I, I was living. And um, the other phrase that I had on a plaque was life that – no, it, it's, it says we do not remember days. We rem- remember moments. And mm-hmm. so those began to, those began to be the, the things that I lived by. And that was before ALS even. Hmm. And um, it's just that it's it's all about grabbing the moments of life, recognizing the moments in life, living your best life as as well as you can, uh, not saying no when you can when you can say yes, um, hmm. doing the things you want to do because this life is brief, and it's the one life we know we have. Um, so that's just kind of something I've been even more so focused on in the last few months. Mm. I like that a lot. Is there, where are you getting this new life theology? <laughs> if I want to call it that, you know, but like where, where philosophy, philosophy. Brady. I'm, okay. Theology for people that aren't in denial. <laughs> well, I don't know that I got it anywhere. It's just that I, uh, philosophy. I just, I just decided I'm, I'm doing a thing, you know, the thing we're doing, the, the speaking I'm doing and the podcast we call it dying out loud. Right. And and it's really more about living out loud because we're talking about death and we're facing it. I'm facing it as an atheist without worrying about an afterlife because in my opinion, Christians have a fetish for the afterlife. Mm. And what that causes you to do is to minimize this life and minimize mm. the moments we have. Right. If you're looking forward to like a vacation um, a few months away, you're going to – the the stuff that you're doing every day right now you're going to overlook mm, because mm. you're focused focused on what's coming down the road and that's what i think they do with heaven <laughs> and so it causes you to not realize that you're you're passing by the everyday moments and the beautiful moments that that come your way if you're just if you're just aware of it and so that's what we talk that's what i'm talking about more than dying is is living and 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 that's a focus that a lot of people that are hearing me are taking away. It's, that's a message they're taking away is that, you know what? I'm, I'm missing life. I'm getting caught up in shit that doesn't matter. Hmm. I'm getting frustrated about stuff that doesn't matter. And, and I've got to quit doing that. And, and, and some friends of mine made this thing, uh, this bracelet that it came out of a, a, one of our <laughs> local meetings. And I it's the W. A WWDD bracelet. Mm-hmm. What would Dave do? Uh huh. And Love and it. it it's just sim- it's just simply <laughs> stopping in the midst of of chaos and randomness and saying, yeah, you know what? This doesn't this doesn't really matter. Nothing yeah. really matters. There's very very few mm. things that really matter when you put it down. And and what matters is connecting with people, being present, 
being human, being kind, mm -hmm. being loving, uh, being compassionate, and being a good person. Those mm -hmm. things we can all do every single fucking day mm -hmm. if we're just focused on the right things. It's that simple. Hmm. So I like that you, I, I really like that phrase, we don't remember days, we remember moments. And it kind of got me thinking about like uh, the compare and contrast my experience and my my favorite memories from before my deconversion and after my deconversion right and right it's like the 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 juxtaposition was like for, first of all before i deconverted i had a lot less i had a lot fewer quote unquote moments i think that i really like look back on that are meaningful to me still now and i, I right, was right i was thinking about the reason for that and it's <laughs> it's sort of like we have to like Christians are sort of obligated to disregard meaningful moments if they're not God centered, hmm. you know. Exactly, um, exactly. And a lot of times, also in addition to that, you're sort of waiting on God to bring you a moment, and God rarely yes. does that because God doesn't exist, you know. So <laughs> yeah, so you're always waiting for God to come through. I remember going on retreats or going on oh, mission God. trips. And like, sort of expecting and waiting for God to show up and for there to be a Thursday moment. Thursday night, baby. A meaningful, yeah, mm -hmm. right, exactly. On the, yeah, yeah, the on around the, the campfire. Night, yep. Everybody crying. Those were the those were the moments that I embraced back then, and they weren't meaningful because of God. They were meaningful because of the interactions I was having with my peers. But mm. I'm just interested in what you what, what you think about the ways that belief in in God and in the Christian God particularly sort of limit your ability to notice those moments. Yeah, I think because you're looking for God in it, and God so rarely shows up. In fact, He never shows up because right. He's not there. Yeah. So you do, like you said, you you and and the moments you might remember were simply created by humans, mm -hmm. like because. Humans created the campfire. Humans created the music. Humans brought the people together. It was humans connecting. Mm -hmm. God was nowhere to be found in that. So the moment you did have was a human moment, not a God moment. Mm. And so that's that's even more – we're more aware of it now as atheists because we're not looking for God to show up in it. We're making our own moments. We're, we're making room for the moments is a phrase I like to use. And, and, and I've – my friends have really – we've all become more aware of this, um, because, like, and, there, and they can be little moments. They can be big moments that you're looking forward to, like um, gathering with friends on the Isle of Capri in Italy mm. and, and o overlooking a beautiful piece of, of land and, and ocean and recognizing how amazing this was that we're here right now together. Mm -hmm. But it can also be an impromptu gathering where friends are just hanging out – you're talking, you're laughing, you're having some drinks, and you just pause and realize how wonderful this is. Mm. Just mm. to be, just to be with people, and and we miss it if we're not looking for it. That's the point. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I feel like I can't. I feel like it's hard to understate the value of that, right? Because that's literally all we have. You know, I mean, like that it, is. It really. That's the. It really that's what is. makes or breaks a good life. Is like. Do you notice the moments? Are you willing to put in the work to create them? And that's a that's a good point. Put in the work to create it or make room for it. Right. Um, yeah. Right. And if we get caught up in the mundane and the busyness and this and this the structure and the schedules and the pressure of life, it can suck the life out of us and mm. suck the moments out mm -hmm. of us. And and then we end up just going through our days and and we don't make room for the stuff that. It really matters, and that's a lot of what I'm talking about. It's really simple, but it's 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 easy to miss. That's all. I mean, I really love that. So, I feel like a big part of that. I feel like a big part of these moments is human interaction. I mean, you really emphasize that as like a lot of the the moments that you describe. And it, it's not. It doesn't have to be right. You can watch a sunset by yourself, and that can be a moment. But a lot of it is a lot of it comes down to community and i feel like you you have some really interesting things to say about christian community versus secular community and yeah. pa particularly um at post diagnosis right the, right the different the juxtaposition between the mm. way the christians that you know reacted and the way that your secular friends reacted yeah the christians basically said i'll be i'm praying for you 
And um, I mean, my mom and sister came to visit, but other than that, there's been very little effort for them to connect with me as a human. Hmm. It's because they don't know how to value the humanity that I live in. Hmm. And it's 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 all about eternity and God's plan and God's will. And after all, Dave, you're you're separated from God because you're running from God and all those things in their minds. <coughs> whereas whereas my atheist friends, recognizing that this life is all we have and how valuable it is, they've run toward me. Hmm. They've run to, toward hmm. my pain. They've got they've got gotten in the middle of it with me. Hmm. And an example of this is a moment that we had a few months ago where, again, it was just a random collection. A couple of us were – it was back in March. I remember because we were watching uh, basketball on, at a bar on TV. And um, we were just sitting around talking, shooting the shit and having drinks. And one of the guys, my friend Brian, who's also an ex-pastor, he says um, – out of the blue, he says, Dave, um, I just want to ask you – if can I be there with you at the end? Hmm. And That's, I said, wow. um, I said, wow, man, are you are you serious? And he said, it would be an honor for me. And I, and then my other two friends, Cass was one of them, and Eric, they both said chimed in, said, well, yes, me too, we too, we want to be there, we want to be there. And that kind of thing, I mean, it brought tears. We all started crying, and. Mm. Um, and it's just that kind of connection to my humanity mm-hmm. yeah, fuck. that that I found to be so meaningful. Mm. I feel like Christians get hung up on, yeah. I mean, like like you said, hung up on eternity, but like you're also hung up on like, I have to convince this person to believe a certain thing. I have to help them think a certain way. You know, there's like, like the yeah. thing that came into my head while you're explaining that is like Christians have to try to convince you not to feel sad about what's happening They have an to you. agenda. Whereas, yeah, they have an agenda. They want to be in charge of your... Right. Whereas your, yeah. your secular they have an friends... Agenda. They want, mm. Yeah. There's no agenda. There's no agenda. There's just us. There's just human beings living life together. And Christians have an agenda. What's God's will? What's God saying? What's God think about Dave's situation? Dave's dying. He's not right with God. So how do I interact with that? Mm. What do I do with that? They don't know what to do with it. Mm. They're concerned I'm going to go to hell when I die. And yet you would think with that, if that's really pressing on their minds, you would think they'd be beating my door down to try to persuade me to. Yeah, exactly. But it's like, I mean, but but it's because they have not, they have to live with (laughs) it. Right. They have to live with the cognitive dissonance of knowing that ever, I think, I think most Christians subconsciously know that the, the beliefs that they have to push on people interfere with their ability to have meaningful relationships with them. So they are, they're caught in this middle world where they're like, man, I would really like to just join. Like their, their instinct is to join you in your pain and to be there and to just experience it and to just say, this sucks, this fucking sucks. Let's get through mm. it, you know, it, but, it's, but accept it, right? But there is this barrier that is, yeah. you know, how do I, how do I do that? But also convince them to I go to heaven. I find it sad. I, I, I feel it's very, very sorry. It's for incredibly them, sad. Yeah, it's sad to me. And I, you know, I don't. It's not like I'm missing that connection. I mean, mm. it's it's been so long now that I don't really worry about it. But I just feel sad that they can't join in humanity. Right. You know, yeah. hum- humanity is pretty amazing if if we learn how to live it. Mm-hmm. Damn. There was a great episode of Grace and Frankie where they had a friend who was diagnosed with something and wanted to use du- euthanasia and kind of go on her own, you know? And it was so interesting yeah. to see each one of those characters the ones who wanted to go in front and say, no, you're doing it wrong. Let me tell you how you should be handling this and the decisions you should make. Um, you are building up a wall and you're not going to be able to be there as much. And so, of course, for the episode, she learned that. And it was a beautiful, you know, send off a great episode of Grace and Frankie. But that's what it is so much this reminds me of is just letting people be who they are and in charge mm-hmm. of their own life. Mm-hmm. Um God, so much of evangelicalism is is the opposite of that, isn't it? Uh, oh, let yeah, me come absolutely. in and I mean, tell you yeah. what you're doing wrong and what you need to well, change. Well, they want to dictate. You need to they, want to, they want to dictate who you marry. They want to dictate your sexual orientation. Right. Mm. They even in my situation, they want to dictate 
whether we're allowed to die with dignity or not. I mean, mm. that's because of Christian subculture in this country that we even have laws that prevent that. Exactly. I mean, it's right. ridiculous. Yeah, hmm. for sure. So that's a that's actually a really good point. So Christianity obviously has a very, very unhealthy view of death, and it does it affects our culture at large to the point where now Huge. it is it's like even secular people are terrified of death. Death is depressing. Death is off the table for for discussion and conversation. A lot of like our entertainment avoids the topic of death unless it's like cool or exciting. Or, you know, unless it's like the, the superhero killing the bad guy or something like that. We don't, we're really afraid of the concept of death. And I'm interested in now that you are here and you're confronting your, your death, your, your own mortality, what, what, what kind of perspective can you give people that are afraid of death and even more so like Christians who are, you know, have this kind of warped or no, I'm sorry. I miss. I miss. I misphrased that question. <laughs> like you're trying to make the question more and more depressing. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. What? What? Uh, w- what perspective would you offer former Christians who are still intimidated by the concept of Ooh, death? I think is probably a better okay. way to word it. Yeah, I've heard from I've heard from several of them actually, um, and I think that the simple answer to that is just chill the fuck out. It's um, <laughs> death. Death is is just simply the end of this life we're living. Hmm. It's nothing to be afraid of. It's nothing to be weird. We get weird about. The reason that we're weird about it is because we don't know anything about it. It's this great unknown. Mm-hmm. We don't know what's next. We don't know what happens. We don't know what it's going to feel like because it. J- we just haven't been there. So we're always afraid of the unknown. But I think a lot of our Christian subculture. Uh, feeds into that. I, I, I found that Christians, my observation is Christians are more afraid of death than than secular people are, and they're more in denial right. of it. And yeah. you would think, you'd think it's the opposite, but it's not. Um, and people have asked me many times in the last few months, are you afraid of dying? And I don't want to sound like some, brav- you know, I don't want to have some false bravado, like, oh, God, no, you know, let me at it. Mm-hmm. But sure. it's just, it's. I'm really not. Um, I'm afraid of not living. I'm afraid of missing Mm. The stuff, the, the stuff that's there. I don't want to let. Go. I don't want to leave the party early, mm-hmm. so to speak. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So God, like that's that. that's more my mindset than mm. the actual ending of you know. The bottom line is, I'll go to sleep one day and I won't wake up, mm-hmm. and that's that's not that's that's not that bad actually. You right. Know? Um, it's it's really worse for the people I leave behind. That's that's the issue, mm-hmm. and I'm aware of that. So I'm I'm cognizant of the of the pain and anguish that will follow my passing uh, more so than my own passing. Um, Mm. But I just, I think that's something we got to take. That's why I'm talking about it because no one wants to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so by talking about it, we take the mystery out of it and we treat it as, as though it's fairly normal because, Oh, by the way, it is. I like Mm. that. Who was that? Uh, He was on Bill and Ted. One of the, the really famous guy helped me out here. Uh, Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves. He, he was asked. <laughs> he was asked recently what his belief is about death. It was. I think it was on Jimmy Fallon or something. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah, he responded by saying he just kind of took a pause and he said, "The only thing I know for certain is that the people we left behind miss us." And yeah, I, God, I thought that was so fucking profound. Um, well, it's true, and that's what I'm more aware of than my own passing because I'm just gonna not be here, and then everybody else has to deal with me not being here. Mm-hmm. And I know I'm gonna leave a void because I'm a big personality, and I, a lot of people love me, and I'm a big deal. I'm a really big deal. I don't know if y'all know that or not, but I'm a really big deal. <laughs> I'm well, picking up like on it. I'm picking up your thirtieth <laughs> podcast yeah. that you've been wait, on. Your, you know, like who are we? G- does your apartment smell of a rich <laughs> mahogany? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, but no, I'm aware that, uh, that we leave a void, you know, that, yeah. that the, the, the person that was there is not no longer there and, and the people mm. have to go on without you. And, and that's the harder part. It really Shit. is. So <clears throat> I, I have a question and I hate putting it this way, but like, 
okay, you're talking about leaving a void, but in a way, like from what I understand about your family is that not everybody is accepting of you mm. leaving the faith. Right. And so right. you and I have some of that in common because me coming out as gay, um, before this episode, Chuck brought this to my attention. He's like, you know, being a parent or, you know, that's kind of iced out for leaving the faith is it's shitty, you know, and that's kind of a different dynamic right. than what we're used to. It's usually um, the other way around. Like usually the, the parents reject the kids, right? Right. Like how my dad right. with me um, and my mom for a while, but she's coming around. God bless her soul. Tell us about that. What has that been like for you? Well, it's been so long now that I've kind of, uh, it's one of those things you just, the pain can only, you can only carry the pain of that for so long, and then mm. it, it either debilitates you or you learn how to live with it. Mm. And I learned how to live with it, mm-hmm. and I learned yeah. how to um, manage my expectations and and understand where they're coming from. And I don't fault people for doing that. It's just what they have to do mm. to make sense of, of how things are going. Mm. And And if they can't put me in a category that makes sense to them, they have to create one. And so uh, I understand it. Now, is it easy? No. Are there times when I really miss them? Yeah. yeah. But after, after so long a time, you just move on with your life, and you make, you make your own life, and you make, you make your own value system, and you learn, you learn just to deal with it. I think that's true with anything that we encounter in life. We either are going to fight against it, and it's going to cause us a lot of pain and anguish, or we're going to roll with it and make the best of it and Mm. create a new reality. Mm. Wow. I applaud that. It's so so hard. That, yeah, no, I mean, that's really, that's real fucking heavy, you know, but like, I, I mean, I know we get it. I know you get it. And I know like a lot of our listeners get it is like, some people will just never come around, you know, Mm. in this life, unfortunately. And for, and you have to accept that. And, and I, I just, uh, several years ago, I, I was sad and depressed for a long time after um, leaving the faith because my family, some of my family, was disconnected, and you lose family and friends, and and it affects it affects you. So I realized after a while, though, that I was letting them write my story. Mm. In other words, they were they were creating my reality, and once I took the pen back and started writing my own, it didn't their their decisions toward me did not affect me in the same way. Mm. 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 You built a new community. You built a new family for yourself that supports you. Absolutely. Uh, it's a rich community. I'm surrounded by people that love me, that I, I have. It's just funny because after the diagnosis, my mom, who's a fervent Christian and loves Jesus so much, and my sister, they live in Houston, and and they're all Christians. and And so they were telling me that Dave we need to you need to come down and be with us so we can take care of you cuz you don't have any family there all my kids live elsewhere and mm-hmm. I, I don't have any family and i said mom i i have i have a lot of people that want to take care of me i've mm-hmm. moved in with friends they they're they're committed to me they're not going to abandon me when i get sick and and i'm good i'm i'm covered i really am i've got more people wanting to take care of me than i have room for mm-hmm. and they and, and and so i was talking to my sister a couple of days after that, and I said, I'll come down and see you guys when I can. I'm really busy. Um, but she said, no, we decided we want to come see you because we want to meet your people. Mm-hmm. And I, it occurred to me, when she said that, it occurred to me that they don't have any context for my community. And in their mind, if it's not family and it's not church, they can't possibly conceive of who I would have in my life mm-hmm. that would be that close to mm-hmm. But it's a positive that they're so they a curiosity, did. right? That they're wanting and they to did. meet. They came yeah. and met my atheist. They came and met my atheist friends, <laughs> and they realized these are normal, good people. It went well. So maybe they're, yeah. Oh my god, I love <laughs> it. I think that's kind it of a part right. of it, though. Is that you people? Wait, just wait, wait. Your friends meet. don't have like devil horns or like or like uh, sacrifice you know children what? or anything. <laughs> we. We all we all wore hats to cover up the horns, and we didn't need any babies that night. So all right, cool. Okay, right, we went well. I'm glad you guys showed some self-control. And that's one of the other things I'm doing more and more so, and I'm using the word atheist with 
with a certain degree of intentionality. Yes, I've noticed. A lot of people, a lot of people tiptoe around that word because sure. it's got such a negative connotation. Mm-hmm. And what I want to do is take the veil off of that and say, you know what? We're atheists. We're good people. We love. We're kind. We're generous. Um, we don't. We're not angry. We're not mean. Um, we're just like you. In fact, you're as much much an atheist as I am, dear Christian. You just I just believe in one fewer God than you do. It's that mm, simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we actually talk a lot about community building on this show. It, it seems like one of the most common issues or questions that we get asked is like, how the fuck do you do it? Right. So, and, but the, but the yeah. answer is, is different for everybody. So we always like to, you know, when somebody has a, has a, a rich thriving community that is a, that is a former Christian, we always, we always ask, how'd you do it? Well, oh, I also uh, like really a hard. brief note before he answers that he lives with Cass Midgley, who was just on the show oh, like yeah. uh, two, three episodes ago. So well, anyway, me. continue. Oh. Yeah, we do a lot of we we pass out tracks, we go door to door, and we convert people to atheism. <laughs> so it's worked, it's, it's worked really well. No, you know, I I realize that Nashville we have a very unique situation here because yeah. I'm in touch with ex-Christian atheists all over the country mm. and very it's very rare to find as large a group we have like a right. local group of 50 some odd people mm. wow and um, it's just a unique situation I don't know how you do it I think it's gonna it's gonna grow exponentially because more and more of us are coming to this conclusion that God's not real and we're Cass and I meet them all, I, I'm meeting them everywhere. I'm hearing from people all over the world, literally, hmm. that are hearing my podcast and seeing stuff. And Cass hears from them that hear his podcast. You guys hear, I'm sure. More and more people everywhere are letting go of this uh, notion of Christianity, and and they're looking for communities like ours. Mm-hmm. So it, it, they're going to grow everywhere. Right. They're going to grow. Every- I think our strategy has been to just grow online with like communities like um you know what we have is associated with the life after or evangelical and kind of and now i've seen a lot of those are kind of branching off to meetups in real life and i think mm-hmm. that that's been kind of yeah. like, that's been a cool pro- yeah. process right to kind of see those things branch off into their own little micro yeah and i'm starting i'm starting to book more um i'm traveling more uh the last half of the year and into next year speaking at uh, small groups and, and little community gatherings and whatever kind of humani- you know, humanist churches, Unitarian churches, that sort of thing. Hmm. And um, I love, love, love connecting with the people in person. It's just one of my favorite things. I love that. Very cool. All right, uh, Dave, before we go, um, we want to let you go because you, you've, you've spent, you've, Brady, given us Brady a lot of time. A, Brady, I, put I put together, a together. Brady put together a very brief game. Yeah, this is called um, Where Would You Go When You Die? Okay, so I've got <laughs> I've got a couple of would you rather scenarios and I want to hear what your answer is. Um, first one, would you rather go to heaven with your old coworkers or hell with your friends? B. B. <laughs> would you like to go to heaven to find out that it's all cartoon or hell to find out that it's all pizza? <laughs> I love pizza, man. So far, hell's winning. Hell's going. Hell's pizza going. Pizza party. I think. Wait. I, I, I kind of want to throw my hat yeah, in what here. Yeah. What would you? I go? feel like. I feel like I would go for cartoon heaven, but like I don't think I would get along with the community there. But you know, cartoons are pretty dope. Like, I would love to be a cartoon. I, if it's like a Rick or Morty thing, I'd probably still go for the pizza because I was man, thinking you could adventure die time. in weird ways. In yeah, that that's show. true. I was that's thinking adventure true. time. That's very true like that. Um, <laughs> here, here's, here's, I like, this is probably the most thought provoking. Catholic purgatory where everybody's there. So I'm thinking like Pleasantville where everything's black and white. Okay, sure. Or evangelical heaven, but there's only evangelicals there with you. <laughs> mm no, no, don't want any part of that. Got to go with purgatory. Love it. And then finally, last question, eternal life or Honey Nut Cheerios? <laughs> I just can't conceive of eternal anything. Right. I mean, I don't, I don't care what the best thing is. I mean. I get bored pretty fast. Can you imagine, can you imagine an eternal orgasm? 
I, I can't. Mm. I don't I know. Well, have you seen those? Just, there's people that have like their buttons malfunctions <laughs> and they're, ha- you know, they're constantly having <laughs> orgasms and it is, it sounds like that. hell. It sounds pretty awful. Oh my God. No, I just, I mean, anything that's great like that, if you, if you're mm. doing it all the time, it loses its value. Well, even the angels Seriously. got bored with God and wanted to get out of heaven dipped, after a while. They they they're like the one third of them out. were like, Fuck a it. third of them said, I'm out of here. Yeah. This is crazy. God, the theological I can't even get into that. I can't even get it. <laughs> we, did, yeah. we um we don't want to take up any more of your time. <laughs> Damn it. Can Brady. we make that joke? Damn Is it, Brady. Too soon. Uh Dave, I am running out of it. Apparently. <laughs> Dave, we want to thank you so much for stopping by and spending some time with us today. Uh, was, so everybody so knows Dave's uh <laughs> but uh, totally balked on that one uh dave's podcast dying out loud definitely worth checking out um he's been doing some speaking events um you can find him on fi- you have an f- active facebook page right in a twitter yeah just just go to dave dave warnock uh dying out loud that's my facebook page it's public uh you can also email me reach out at, at dave out loud at gmail.com very cool and uh yeah as any, lots of ways to find me so i'd love to connect with anybody that this resonates with i love hearing from the people that that are hearing me very cool and i'm going to say this because you're not um you have a patreon page where people can give uh help out with your expenses and everything until you continue doing your traveling until that's over so bam find yeah that. that's basically to to share the cost because a lot of groups want to bring me in but they don't have much budget as a sure. small group so we don't want to we don't want to be inhibited by cost so if totally you know if somebody wants us to come we want to come and and have the money to to travel and do that sort of stuff so that's what that's really about yeah god that's so important i want to thank you so much for doing that that's so important because as a a fellow atheist like to have somebody go out and explain no there's other ways for us to deal with death head on shit that's so important so important and i know that some of our listeners that's always a thing that comes up is how do we deal with this now what do we think because we relied on this crutch now this crutch is gone right now it's fine because your your bones are healed now you you can walk on your own (laughs) time to walk on your own that's it walk on your own you're a big boy you can do it we can do it kathy bates misery here (laughs) <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Um, and hey, Dave, we have a we have a theme, we have a we have a motto on this show that like we a little catchphrase, there, of a sorts. little catchphrase, and that is: um, if you don't go to church, Sunday Sundays is just, just a second, second Saturday. Saturday. Thanks everybody for listening. Thank and you, Dave. Subscribe thank and rate guys. us on iTunes, and we will see you next time. Let me unpack that for you a little bit.